Well, before I begin today, I want to thank some people. First, I want to thank all of you for choosing the 8 a.m. service to worship on Easter Sunday morning. By doing that, you've created space uh, for someone else to sit in that seat later this morning at the 9.30 and 11. So thank you so much for that. I want to thank Anton and uh, Ricky and our entire worship team for leading an outstanding morning of worship today. And I want to thank our facilities team. These are guys who work behind the scenes. I don't know if you're aware, but between Thursday evening and this morning, we will have had 18 services on four campuses between communion services and worship. And that's a heavy lift for our facility staff. So I want to thank them this morning. Will you join me in thanking our facility staff? <clears throat> And then lastly, we have a, had a whole decorating team here uh, this week, decorating for Easter. You can see the flowers and the th and Risen King up here and out in the lobby. There's a photo booth on that side. So I want to thank them as well. And take time today as you leave to get a family photo somewhere. Uh, the photo booth's on that side. There's a cross display over there. You can come up by the flowers. But get a photo to remember Easter at Chapel Street 2024. Just wanted to get those things out of the way. Well, a number of years ago, <clears throat> my wife, Lorene, and I were invited to attend a marriage conference for pastors and wives that happened to be in South Florida. And the conference was scheduled for late February, so we spent all winter long looking forward to this, those three days uh, to be away from phone calls and meetings and ministry, to focus on just each other and marriage, uh, and to enjoy the warm Florida sun. So you can imagine how excited we were when we finally got on what we called the plane to paradise. Uh, we went to our seats and she had the window seat, I had a middle seat, and then the aisle seat was open. No one sat there. And that made me happy. I thought, perfect. We got our own little cocoon of happiness here, just the two of us. And then just before they shut the plane door, one more lady got on and she walked straight back and sat right in that seat. Now, I know it wasn't her fault. You know, that was just her assigned seat. But I, I, I wasn't happy about that uh, because we lost our cocoon of happiness and I wanted to get it back. So I flipped down my trade table, got out my sermon notes, whatever I was working on, and sent this clear psychic force field that said, do not disturb. <laughs> Couldn't have been more clear if I hung a sign in my ear. Uh, but the lady sitting next to me, um, whose name turned out to be Betty, took about 30 seconds and she just charged right through my force field. She said, so, you on vacation? In a way too perky voice. And I resisted the urge to say, uh, until just a minute ago, I didn't say that, I was polite. I said, well, sort of, we're going to a conference, hoping that would satisfy her curiosity. But Betty didn't even pause for a breath. Oh, a conference, what kind of conference? And my wife who knows me well, uh, rescued me by saying back to Betty, uh, we're going to a marriage conference. And Betty says, oh, a marriage conference, that's nice. My husband and I have been married for 17 years. That's a long time, right? 17 years, you know what I mean? I mean, it hasn't been easier too, you know? We've had lots of our troubles up and down, let me tell you, 17 years. And now I'm thinking, and I'm not proud of this, great. All I want is a little peace and quiet, and I'm sitting next to a pathological talker with marriage problems. And then my wife leans over and says, are you on vacation? I'm thinking, no, don't encourage it. <laughs> she says, no, I'm going to spend a week with my mother. We're putting our dog to sleep and it was just too sad. I had to get away. We've had him 16 years. He was our baby. You wanna see a picture, she said. And she got out her wallet. I'm not making this up. So I'm not in my cocoon of happiness anymore. I'm not thinking warm Florida thoughts. I'm looking at pictures of a total stranger's dog. And then Betty said that her dog was so special because she hadn't been able to have children of her own, that her only pregnancy ended in a miscarriage. And as she said that, her voice began to tremble and her eyes just filled with sadness. And right about that time, I sensed God speak to me. Not out loud, but just inside, you know, that, that prompting you get. And what he said was something like this. Hey, knucklehead, here is a woman filled with sadness, desperate to talk to someone, and I've arranged to put her in a seat right next to an ordained pastor with an advanced degree in pastoral counseling and his wife who's got a master's degree in clinical psychology. Do you think you can get with the program? <laughs> and he was a little irritated. Now, we're going to come back to Betty in just a bit, but I want to start with her because I think Betty helps us understand 
something about the heart of the great story we look at today. We're wrapping up a seven-week series we've called Unrecognized King. And if you've been with us for some or all of it, you know we've looked at six different stories up to this point where Jesus makes this statement about himself and then does something, sometimes spectacular, to prove that particular statement. He said, I am the bread of life. And he fed 5,000 people with a, with a sack lunch. He said, I am the light of the world. And he healed a man born blind. He said, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. And he raised Lazarus from the dead. He said, I am the true temple. And he threw the money changers out of the temple. And then last week he said, I am the king of prophecy. And he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. And each time we saw that some recognized him, but many did not. And today we come to the story that's right at the center of the story of Jesus, the very center of our faith, the story without which there would be no Christianity, there would be no church, no hope of eternal life. We're talking about the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Now I'm going to read the whole story that comes to us in John's gospel. It will be in John chapter 20. I'm going to read through the whole story. It's 18 verses. I'm going to point out some really important things that we can easily miss along the way, and then we'll dig into the heart of the story. John chapter 20 beginning in verse one, you can watch on the screens. Now on the first day of the week, which would have been Sunday in that culture, the first day of the work week in ancient Israel, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Let's pause here. What we should see here is that the whole story in John's gospel begins with a woman. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb to finish the job of preparing Jesus' body properly for burial in the Jewish tradition. They had not been able to finish on Friday evening because the the, the Sabbath began, began. And so she's back there early on Sunday to finish that job. Now, we know that Mary had been a very, very troubled woman before she met Jesus. We are told in the Gospels that Jesus had healed her from seven demons, We don't exactly know what that means, but she was a very troubled woman and had then become a faithful and devoted follower of Jesus. So why is this significant? Well, there are many, many people, even today in our culture, who believe that because this story is about a resurrection, it must be fabricated. That that just doesn't happen, so this has got to be just religious fiction, a religious fairy tale. But here's the thing. No ancient writer, even a fiction writer, would think about starting a story with a woman as the first observer of the empty tomb, especially this woman with a troubled past. Because in those days, in that culture, the testimony of a woman was not regarded as reliable. No one would start a story this way unless, of course, this is how it really happened. Verse 2, so she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. A couple things here. Uh, Notice how John identifies himself. He says, the one whom Jesus loved. Now, he's doing this partly because he's just being humble. It's a humble way of writing a story and a way to insert yourself into it. But what I notice is his statement of identity here. You know, there's lots of talk about identity in our culture today, how what we think of ourselves, we identify ourselves by gender or by race or by role or by politics. But notice what John does here. He identifies himself not as a Jewish man, not as one of the 12 chosen by Jesus, not one of the inner circle of three, which he was, not as the author of this book, the Gospel of John, or the author of the book of Revelation, which he also wrote, not even as the one that Jesus trusted to take care of his own mother, which was also true, but simply as the one whom Jesus loved. Our identity as followers of Jesus is not something that we have to earn or we have to achieve, or that we accomplish, or that we create out of our own imagination, is something we receive. We receive by faith from him. And my hope today is that for each and every one of you, that whenever you think about yourself, whenever you try to identify yourself, that the first thought that comes to your mind is this. I am one whom Jesus loves. I also noticed that even though Jesus has already talked about his own death and resurrection at least three times, the first assumption of his followers was somebody must have stolen the body. 
They must have taken him somewhere else. Verse three. So Peter went out with the other disciple and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Now I love this little humorous bit of detail here. John ran faster than Peter. We don't know why. Some scholars think because John was younger than Peter. Maybe he was in better shape than Peter. Maybe he ran track in high school. We don't know. Maybe he's just poking fun at his great friend Peter. We don't know. But it's, it's a little detail that serves no purpose in the story whatsoever. So it gives every indication of just being part of an eyewitness account. This is the way it happened. Verse five, and stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloth lying there, but he did not go in. Maybe he was fearful of being defiled by the presence of a human body, which was what the Jewish people would have believed. Then Simon Peter came following him and he went into the tomb. That's like Peter, he just barged right in. He saw the linen cloth lying there and the face cloth with, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. I just wanna point out some detail here as to how the dead were buried in that culture. Body was wrapped completely in linen cloth, strips of linen cloth with a separate cloth for the face or the head. And we saw this already in John chapter 11 with the story of Lazarus. Uh, after Jesus calls Lazarus from the tomb, here's what we read. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Now, but here in John 20, notice there's no body around which the cloths are wrapped. They're just lying there undisturbed, folded up neatly. And this is weird because if the body had been stolen, they wouldn't have unwrapped it first and taken it, they would have taken the whole thing. So what's going on here? Verse eight, then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Now I want you to see something really important here, something that I saw for the first time, I think, in studying this passage just recently. Peter goes into the tomb and sees the grave clothes lying folded up neatly. Uh, John goes in and he sees but a different word is used that we can't see it in English. A different word for seeing is used here that means to see and to perceive, to consider. And then it says, he believes. And then the very next line is, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. You see that? That doesn't make sense, does it? But what it tells me is that it's possible to believe without understanding everything. I have a guess there's at least someone here today who has questions about the whole faith thing. You have questions about Jesus. You have questions about the Bible. And I do too, actually. But let me tell you this. You can believe, according to this story, you can believe without having all of your questions answered. You can believe without having all the blank lines filled in. That's what the story tells me. I mean, I don't understand how 747s fly, but I get in them. This story tells me you just have to see enough to believe. Verse 10, then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they've taken away my Lord and I do not know where they've laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. Again, notice the resurrected Jesus appears first, not to one of the 12 men who were the disciples, or 11 by this time without Judas, but to a woman. If this story was invented, just concocted as a mythology out of the first century, there's no way that first resurrection appearance would be told of happening to a woman and not to one of the male disciples. And even now, notice she doesn't recognize Jesus fully, maybe due to shock and surprise. She wasn't expecting it, maybe due to the early morning light. Maybe something's changed in his appearance, but she doesn't yet recognize him. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary. 
She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. So here we stand at the single most important event in all of human history, resurrection. And what does Jesus do? Wouldn't you think he might go, I'm back, check it out. I told you, I've been telling you. I'm no, he doesn't do that. He asks two deeply personal questions to a grieving woman. First one is, why are you weeping? Why are you weeping? We ended up talking to Betty for the entire three-hour flight. And when I finally got around to listening to her, uh, it became obvious we were sitting next to a woman who had experienced a great deal of pain in her life. Struggles in her marriage had left her feeling lonely. And the loss of her only pregnancy had left her with unresolved grief and disappointment. She had looked to her dog of 16 years for companionship and comfort, and now even the dog was gone. Early on, she had tried church, her church tradition, and she found only judgment and guilt, was actually told she wasn't a faithful enough member. We encouraged her, and she didn't live near here, we just said come to Chapel Street, and she lived in Chicago, so we encouraged her to find a church that actually taught the Bible where she could learn about her relationship with Jesus. But she had many, many reasons to weep. Every parent knows what it's like to hear a child burst into tears and to go running to them and scoop them up and say, where does it hurt? What happened? Why are you crying? And when they're four or five, it might be a scraped knee. When they're 10 or 12 or 14, it could be a broken bone. When they're 18 or 20, it could be a broken heart. But something happens to us as we grow older. We get better and better at hiding the things that hurt. We get better and better at hiding our pain. So if I were to ask today, why do you weep? And if you were honest, there'd be as many answers as there are people in the room today. It might be personal loss. We all eventually lose people we love. It might be physical suffering. It might be broken relationships. I've been watching March Madness, and just yesterday they told a story of a famous coach, famous women's coach, who hasn't spoken to her own father in 37 years. Imagine the pain that that brings. So Mary weeps at the tomb of Jesus. Her grief is real. She's lost her great friend, the one who had transformed her life from the inside out. Her despair is real. Her faith has been shattered. Her hope has been crushed. So why do you weep today? What losses do you grieve? What wounds do you carry secretly inside that very few, if anybody, knows about? Well, the resurrection brings two things to us today. First, comfort, because this Jesus knows our pain. In Isaiah 53, when he speaks of the promised Messiah to come, he writes, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Jesus was the one who wept at the death of a friend. Jesus was one who was betrayed and abandoned by his closest friends. He was the one who cried from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's the one who died rejected, humiliated, and alone on a Roman cross. So whatever it is that you experience today, whatever is painful, he knows and he understands. Secondly, the resurrection also brings hope. Mary here is lost in her tears until she hears him say her name, Mary. It's when he speaks her name that she recognizes him. It's when he speaks her name that she knows she's no longer alone. The risen Jesus comforts her in her pain. He brings hope to her despair and healing to her broken heart. And this same Jesus offers us comfort and hope today because he knows our name. He knows your name. He knows where we experience pain, and he speaks your name today. And that leads us to the second question. The first one was, why are you weeping? The second one is, who are you seeking? Whom are you seeking? One of our favorite family stories happened a long time ago. I was putting our two older boys to bed, and their 
youngest brother, who was about two and a half at the time, came running into the room. Uh, and I was surprised and a little bit irritated because he was supposed to be in his room because I'd already put him to bed. But he came running in, and I said, what do you need? And he said, made a mess, Daddy. Made a mess. And so I said, well, go back to your room. I'll be there in a minute. And as he turned to leave, something made me ask, uh, hey, what kind of mess? And his eyes got big, and he said, with the fish. And that got my attention. So I put the other guys to bed, ran into the room, and discovered he had pushed a chair over to a bookcase at the edge of the room where we had one little plastic fishbowl. And inside that fishbowl was exactly one fish. It was an angel fish, creatively named Angel, <laughs> by our boys. And he had evidently thought he wanted to feed Angel the angel fish, and he took the canister but it slipped and he dumped the entire canister of fish food into the little fish tank and there was now an inch, of, inch thick sludge of fish food floating on top of the water and angel the angel fish down beneath. And I'm not a marine biologist, but I didn't think that was a good thing. So I put him to bed rather abruptly as I remember and then tried to clean up as best I could. Well, by the next morning, I checked on angel the angel fish and looked a little sluggish. By that evening, Angel the angelfish was floating on the surface of the water, and so I had to break the news to my boys that their fish had succumbed to complications, probably due to overeating, um, and then we had to do a somber bathroom burial at sea, if you know what I mean. Now, that story is kind of a parable of all of human life, I think. My son had a problem. He had created a mess he couldn't clean up by himself, and he came looking for some help. And the same is true for all of us, really. We have a mess that we can't clean up by ourselves, only the mess isn't about fish food. Betty's mess was about grief and loneliness. Peter's mess turned out to be about fear and denial and shame. And our mess might be about sin or shame or guilt. And so where do we look for help? You know, we look for so many places. Our culture tells us to look so many places. Look in self-help books. Look in self-medicating. Numb, our, numb yourself with work or entertainment or through a relationship. Look for someone, something to help clean things up or maybe to make you feel better just for a short time. Mary says, tell me where you've taken him. She's looking for a dead body. That's as far as her hope goes. Show me where you've put the body. And the risen Jesus just says, Mary. I read someone this week said it's the shortest sermon ever preached. One word, her name. Now make no mistake, the center of the Christian faith is not about the ethical teachings of Jesus as powerful as they are. In fact, most of Western culture is built on his teachings. The center of our faith is not based on his compassion for the poor or his healing of the sick. The center of our faith is death and resurrection. Death because there is no forgiveness of sins, without the shedding of blood. That's what scripture says. Because your sin, my sin, the sins of the whole world deserve death and bring death. But resurrection because Jesus is the source of life, the creator of life and the giver of life and in him there is the hope of eternal life. So he speaks her name and her hope is restored. He speaks her name and her sins are forgiven. He speaks her name and she's no longer alone. As I said earlier, so many people, and you can buy a dozen books tomorrow that will say this, so many people believe that the resurrection of Jesus was an imaginary event created by a group of fanatical followers of a deranged Jewish man with a Messiah complex. That's just a religious fairy tale. But it's not so. The resurrection of Jesus is one of the most verified events in all of human history. Even Jesus' enemies agreed that the tomb was empty. Nobody argued that. They just had a different explanation for it. And all the power of Rome, who put him to death, couldn't find the body of one dead man. Even agnostic historians today agree universally that something happened 2,000 years ago that changed the very shape of the world. My father was born in 1933. 
the youngest of six children growing up in post-depression America. His father died when he was just five years old. This was, picture was taken. It's the only photo we have of my, of my dad's family. He's taken the, the Thanksgiving after his father died. He's the little boy all the way to the right. His oldest brother is there all the way to the left. The summer after his father died, his mother sent him to live with an uncle on a farm outside of their town uh, because it was the only way she could guarantee he had enough to eat. As a six-year-old, that little boy didn't understand all that. He just knew he was lonely. He said he would finish chores uh, every day that summer and then go out and sit by the country road that ran by his uncle's farm, hoping that his older brother, who he knew drove a milk truck, would drive by and he could at least wave and feel a little less lonely. He didn't understand that his brother's milk truck, milk route was far, far away. So his brother never drove by all that summer. Much of my father's childhood was like that. Sad, lonely, without much hope. But when he was 15 years old, he was invited by a couple of high school football buddies to go to a, a Methodist tent revival meeting in a small town near his. And that night, my dad heard Jesus speak his name. And he always said that Jesus not only saved him that night, but gave him a sense of identity and purpose and security that completely transformed his life. And from that day forward until the day my dad died in 2022 at age 89, he was never lonely again. He was never without purpose again. And he was never without hope again. He knew that he was one loved by Jesus. He knew he was forgiven and not even death could quench his hope. So today, Easter Sunday, 2024, where do you weep? Where does it hurt? Do you have a mess somewhere in your life that you're struggling to clean up? Who are you looking for? Maybe you've had questions. Maybe you struggle with doubt for months or years even. But today, let me just suggest that you see enough to believe. His name is Jesus. He's here he speaks your name because he is risen. Hallelujah, he is risen. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, how we thank you today for the story we celebrate. How our hearts burn within us at the thought of you speaking our names. By your living spirit, may we hear your voice and may we know we are loved. May we know we are forgiven. May we know we have the great hope of your resurrection life. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Now receive the benediction. May we go now in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our risen King. And may the Holy Spirit fill you with all the hope and joy of his resurrection. Amen. Have a blessed Easter.